All right, hey, welcome to chapter 22. We are going to be talking about master budgets and planning. Um, this is good on the management side, but it's also good on the personal side. If you haven't done budgets for yourself, I highly recommend them. Um, I live on a budget, and I find that when I kind of stop really focusing on the budget, things kind of get a little out of, out of control. So um, budgets are a really good thing. So what are the benefits of a budget? Let's talk about it. First of all, we're able to uh, plan for what we're doing. It, without a budget, we really don't know what we're going to be doing, and we kind of just hope for the best. Things are going to get out of control. We're not. We're going to have shor shortages. We're not going to have people uh, doing what they need to be uh, that needs to get done to sell our products and things like that. So it's a very important thing to have budgets. It controls things. It kind of guides. It tells us what we need to do. And I'll I'll be more specific in a minute when we get to the actual numbers of things, but. Budgets basically guide us as far as telling us what we need to make, how much we need to make, what we need to have for next month. And that could be from anything like raw materials to labor to cash on hand. All of it is available for us. Uh, here are some more of the benefits of the budgeting. You guys can pause this and take a look at it. But ultimately, it's it's a, a way to, to control what we're doing and focus us where we need to focus on. So that's kind of the idea. And there is the level of motivation because obviously, if well, not obviously, I, I don't know why I said that. Uh, motivation for managers to meet their goals because if managers meet their goals, they typically are bonused. So they want to make sure that they're focused on those uh, on those budgets. So again, coordinate all the activities of the employees to do what they're trying to do. And we'll we'll get a little bit more focused on that here in a minute. Um, but anyway, here's budgeting and human behavior. Uh, you see here that we have um, budgets are, are positive because we have our goals, we're bonused on it. If we don't do things, here's the negative outcomes. It can be very pressure oriented and if we don't do what we're supposed to do to get those bonuses, then we're, we could see some fraud, some unethical behavior, things like that we don't want. So that's why we want to make sure when we do our bonuses or we do our incentive pay, we don't base it solely on a budget. We want to do something like a balanced scorecard where you look more at, okay, hey, did you meet your goals? But also, were you productive? Um, if you're in the in the manufacturing, if you meet your goals, hey, we produce this number of units, well, how much of them were rejected? So we want to have a quality control component. Then we also want to have our customer relations component. How are our customers feeling about this? Because if you're just churning out a crappy product, even if some of them aren't rejected, but they're they're kind of breaking really quick, our customers aren't going to be happy. So we want to incentivize our uh, production in a way that isn't just focused on uh, the outcome of, of the budget. And then um, also if employees have underspent, uh, if, if, if managers have underspent, um, we could we could want them to they, they think that hey if, if I don't spend it all now that we're gonna get less next time and uh, we are going to end up with uh, less money and we want to keep that money in our department. This is the thing that frustrates me the most specifically about government is because this is where you get your wasteful spending. Um, it, it's right here on the employees might spend budgets on unnecessary items to ensure the budget is not reduced next rate. This is like a hallmark of government because government will reduce your budget if you don't use it all. Um, there is an off episode of the office that, uh, that goes over this. Um, the, the employees are debating on whether they should buy chairs, a new copier, but if they don't come up and agree, then Michael Scott's going to return the amount to the um, uh, corporate and get a bonus on it. So that's kind of the idea behind this. And, um, and, and this is where you have the problem. Uh, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? So um, we, we always, there's different kinds of budgets. One of them is a rolling budget and we wanna make sure uh, with rolling budgets, we revise it pretty much after each quarter. We have a full year and then as a quarter ends, we add another quarter. Quarter ends, we add another quarter and so on. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. We're constantly looking at the budget and revising it as we need to because things could change. For example, COVID. I would imagine that when COVID hit, people were had a normal budget. They would have had to revise not just the 
end quarter, but they probably would have had to have revised their entire budget based on the production shortfall, uh, the lack of sales, and, and many other aspects. So we see the need for a rolling budget. Uh, it's definitely one of the uh, something that you want to uh, focus on there. All right, so how do we prepare this master budget for a manufacturing company? Let's look at this. This is a really good um, uh, graph. Sorry, I couldn't remember what to call it, graph. Um, this is what's important that you understand this is that everything in a master budget starts with estimated sales because sales is going to drive literally everything else. You've got to have an estimate of how much you're going to sell before you can do any of these other budgets. Okay. So we go from bud, uh, budgeted sales that tells us, okay, if we're going to have this many sales, how many things do we need to produce? And then when we come up with how much we need to produce, we say, okay, to produce those units, how much direct materials do we need? How much fact, uh, direct labor do we need? And how much factory overhead do we need? Once we have all that, that tells us then how much cash do we need? And then from sales, do we need, if we're going to have this, uh, an uptick in sales to where we need additional equipment, okay, we're going to need to have capital expenditures and we're going to have to factor that into our cash as well as general uh, selling and administrative expenses uh, tells us how much cash we have. So all of these are going to tell us what we need as far as our um, um, items that we need. I'm sorry, I drew a blank. Notice over here we have our uh, OIF from our accounting 112 for our uh, cash flow statement. Operating budgets, all these deal with operating activities investing budgets, there's our capital expenditures and stuff. Uh, and then there's our financing, okay? What we're doing with that cash actually and how we're gonna finance it. So lots and lots of good things happening here and you see how it directly relates to the accounting process we learned in accounting 111 and 112. All right, so here's your master budget balance sheet. Okay, it's just a balance sheet, all right? This is just showing you your cash, your accounts received, just basically everything that we have related to our company, all right? It's just kind of a way to start things off. And this is for September 30th. So, um, so since that was September 30th, we have a company here. I don't, is that Toronto? Toronto? Is that how you spell Toronto? Never thought of that. I don't go to Canada ever. Toronto Sticks Company sold, oh, hockey sticks. Okay, so it is Toronto. All right. <laughs> hey, guys, I don't, I'm not a very good speller. God bless spell check. That was the best thing to ever come about in my lifetime <laughs> was spell check. So they're gonna sell 700 hockey sticks at 60 bucks each, okay? Uh, Toronto Six prepared the following sales budget for the next three months. This is September, right? So in September, our budgeted sales are this. We think we're going to sell 1,000 units in October, 800 in November, 1,400 in December. I'm not familiar with hockey, but I'm guessing that October may be like the preparatory month to get ready for hockey. Um, and maybe a little bit more November, and maybe December 1400 because of Christmas. And that's why we see the pattern of the uh, sales there. We got 60 bucks each. So here's our total budgeted sales. This is what Toronto Stick is, has for our budgeted sales. So we know from the manufacturing standpoint, in October, we need 1,000 sticks. September, oh, it did sell 700 sticks. So we're good there. All right, we can move on. So now we need to know how much we're gonna produce. In many situations with these companies, we're gonna have um, a certain amount of inventory that we had left over from last month. And then we wanna have a certain number of inventory left over this month for future sales because we don't have our sales happen at the end of the month or even just in the middle. Sometimes we have sales at the very beginning of the month. So we need to have some inventory at the end of that month to be able to sell that we anticipate for the next month because we're gonna have sales at the beginning of that month. So we can't just say um, of the number of, I'm going backward here. Oh, whoops, one too many. So in October, if we sell a thousand sticks, uh, if all we produced were enough to be a thousand sticks, then in November, on November 1st, when someone comes to buy some of those first 800 sticks, we don't have any because we haven't built them yet. So we gotta have some of these 800 sticks built in October so that we're ready to have them sold in November. And the same thing with September, even though we sold 700, we needed an ending inventory to help us cover the beginning of October. So a lot of times we're gonna have a percentage of that on what we need to produce. 
So we're gonna have budgeted ending inventory and units plus the budgeted sales in that month minus the beginning finished goods inventory we have. So that's what that's talking about. In this situation, uh, the ratio of inventory to future sales, wow, we want 90% of them. That's, that's actually pretty big. That's actually pretty big. So we basically want 90% of ending inventory represented by our next month sales. So in uh, October, we had a thousand sales that we we're gonna have. Um, the month before, we would have had 700 sales, 700 sales, or no, we would have had thousands. So we needed 800. That's what we needed for from September that carried over to October, our ending period. And then uh, the ratio is 90%. Oh, this is next month, sorry. Total required units, uh, less the beginning inventory and units. I guess we had 1,010. It doesn't tell us what they uh, calculated. So in October, we need to produce 710 units. Um, I thought we sold 700 units. And if it's 90% of 1,000, this should have been 900 units. I don't know why the book does this. This should have been 900 units because 90% of 1,000 is what they should have had on hand. But maybe they didn't sell all the thought ones that they thought. I don't know why they did that. But the bottom line is, you see here our desired ending inventory and units here goes over to here. Because that's what we're going to subtract out. We make 710 units. We sell 800. Our next period is 14, 1,400 times 90. So we need desired ending inventory here. Total required units to have in November. Subtract out what we had at the end last year, or last month, excuse me. So we need to produce 1,340, uh, 1,340 units, and so on. So you can see how this works. Uh, if you have any questions on this, uh, the best thing to do is just work on some problems on this, and you'll have some opportunity to do that in the homework. So this is our production budget. So now this is what we know we need to produce, and this is going to derive our um, raw materials, it's going to derive our direct labor, and then we're going to be able to allocate our factory overhead uh, estimated what we're going to do. So the number of units produced times the materials we need to do it is going to give us what we need, uh, and then we're going to subtract out our beginning uh, ending materials. Um, I always find this fascinating. We're, buy, we're 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 making these hockey sticks, right? And it says we need half of a unit for of direct materials. What is a half unit? I mean, are we getting? I don't know how long a hockey stick is, but I'm pretty sure that it's long and then it has the curve at the end. So you've got to like do that and then you've got to adjust it and stuff. What are they, what is this? Like, are we getting these huge long old two by fours or something? Or I don't know, but we're going to cut them in half, whatever they are, and be able to build one from half of that. I don't know. I'm not a hockey guy, like I said. Well, we need, we know we need to produce 710 units. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna need uh, 355 pounds of whatever material wood is what I'm presuming. Okay, um, desired ending material inventory in pounds. So what we're gonna do is we need to take what we need to produce uh, or what we need to buy in direct materials for next month and take half of that and add that to it. So that's gonna give us our total amount we need. We're gonna subtract out how much inventory we have already. So we need to purchase 512 pounds of this merchandise to build of this raw materials, I mean. And then the materials cost per pound is $20. Uh, so our cost for direct materials is going to be $10,240. we are going to be trans transitioning this likely to our cash budget. Okay. Oh, crap, I clicked the button. I didn't mean to do that. I was emphasizing that. Um, so we're going to need to transfer that to our cash budget. Unless we have some kind of deal where we can put this into uh, accounts payable, but more than likely because of this budget, we're gonna we're gonna factor this in as a cash budget, um, and then we just do the same thing for November and December, and we move on along uh, along the way. Okay, same concept as our uh, as our units we produce. Again, now we're doing the cost of direct labor. How many hours does it take to produce a stick? Times the hourly rate times the units we need to produce. That's what we're going for here. So we need 710 uh, units in October. Our direct labor hours for each unit is, is wow, 25.25 hours. That's fast to make a, a stick. Direct labor hours required per unit, 20 point, that's, that's, 
That's 15 minutes to build a stick. That's not a lot of time. This probably is one of those lower end sticks, I'm guessing. Coming from Toronto. Can I have a can? Would you guys be offended if I made Canada jokes? <laughs> they they make inferior products. No, I don't know. I'm just kidding. No, the, the only joke I know about Canada is, you know how they came up with the... Uh, how to spell how to what to name their com their country is they put all the letters in a in a hat in the alphabet a through z and they randomly pulled it out and said c a n a d a and that's how they came up with canada and i i'm not guys i hope that's not offensive it wasn't meant to be it was just uh, you know poking fun at our northern neighbor i know they they poke fun at us all the time so just a little fun poking back so all right, uh, anyway, so we're gonna take our cost per direct labor hour, $12 per hour. Uh, my guess is that's pretty minimum wage nowadays. So, um, you know, we're pretty close. So you get what you pay for. And in Canada, I doubt it's $12. It's probably up to like 18 or 20 bucks an hour, which is insane. But uh, cost of direct labor, this is gonna go to our cash budget too. In all those areas, pretty straightforward on the direct labor budget. And I just kicked my desk with my bare foot. <laughs> Factory overhead, we're going to just basically take whatever our factory uh, percentage is for um, what, we're, what we're estimating it on, and it looks like it's direct labor hours. So we, have, we need 177.5 direct labor hours. Variable overhead rate is $10 per hour, so our budgeted variable overhead is going to be $1,775 uh, dollars for October. The fixed... Uh, budgeted fixed overhead is going to be 1500 so we add those together. So our budgeted total of factory overhead is that 3275 This fixed factory overhead comes from your rent, your depreciation, stuff like that. Your budgeted variable overhead comes from the variable costs and things like your indirect labor, indirect uh, material, stuff like that. <clears throat> and, oh, here it is. $2.5 per unit of production. That's our... A variable portion of this so um variable portion of factory overhead is assigned at a rate of two dollars and fifty cents per unit of production i don't know how they got that direct labor hours needed times the variable overhead rate for direct labor hour is 10. i don't know what they're saying here that doesn't make any sense because it's clearly it's ten dollars. It's not two dollars and fifty cents. Unit of production. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. All right, whatever. All right. Um Toronto Sticks Company can produce uh product cost per unit. So we're gonna go ahead and look at our Total cost per year. Skip through. Ah, oh, this is where they're doing that. I don't know. They should have put that on this slide. That makes more sense. Two dollars and fifty cents uh, variable overhead rate. Um, so total cost per unit is seventeen bucks. Uh, for our direct materials is ten dollars per unit. Three dollars per direct labor variable overhead rate is two dollars and fifty cents. That's where they're getting it. Ten times the point two five. That makes more sense now. Fixed overhead rate. Dollar fifty per unit. There we go. That's a little more understandable. What they should have put that two dollars and fifty cent comment over here. <clears throat> cost of goods sold budget. Here we go. So cost of goods sold budgeted sales and units times the uh, product cost per unit is going to give us our cost of goods sold. Really straightforward. So we took that seventeen dollars that we calculated on the prior page, multiplied by our unit sales each month. That's our cost of goods sold budget. That one's pretty straightforward. Selling expense budget. Okay, so we have our budgeted sales from our sales budget, and then we have our sales commission is 10%. So 10% of each of the sales is gonna be our sales commission. And then we're gonna have our sales manager salary of $2,000 a month. So $2,000 a month, That you know that's $24,000. If I'm a sales manager, I'm making $24,000 a month. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> that's cheap. That definitely wouldn't fly, okay? Um, and there we go. So our total selling expenses, that's going to go to our uh, cash budget as well. General selling and administrative expense, or excuse me, general administrative expenses is just basically how much we expect. And uh, I guarantee you, 
as as uh, sales increases, so are administrative salaries. We're going to need to get some temporary labor probably in December, January time, uh, maybe even October to help cover the busy months. Um, fifty four thousand dollars per year. Think think about this in the terms of like a salary. Fifty four thousand dollars is pretty decent. Okay, it's all right. It's not great. It's not horrible. $54,000 is more likely one person's salary, okay, at an administrative level. And they're trying to convince us that they got people like a CEO or an owner, um, you know, an HR manager, an accounting manager, at least somebody in accounting. I mean, this this company has definitely got money issues because or people that are people that are working for this company clearly have, you know, a side hustle or something. I don't know what they're doing, or they're definitely getting kickbacks. I don't know. Uh, capital expenditures. We're basically saying we don't need anything in October, November, but what do we need in twenty uh, for twenty five thousand dollars in December? Um, doesn't tell us exactly what we wanted. Expected cash to cash payments related sales and purchase of plant assets. All right, some kind of plant asset. Thanks, McGraw Hill, for not even telling us what we're buying. Last thing is our cash budget. We're going to be having to factor in everything that we've done. We have to get to our preliminary cash balance and then we have to determine whether or not we need to get a loan or whether we can repay any loans we have. And if we don't have any loans, how much money we get to put into our coffers or our savings account or whatever. This is our formula. Basically, we have our beginning cash plus our cash uh, receipts minus our cash payments is what we have as our balance. Uh, a lot of times companies have a minimum cash amount because just like everything else, if we have zero at the end of our cash balance, at the end of a month, that means we have no cash at the beginning of the next month to make the purchases we need. We've got to have cash available. So many companies will have a certain percentage of what cash they want based on something, and they'll have that at the end. And then below or above the minimum that they're required to have will tell us whether we need to take a loan or repay a loan or put into our savings account. So let's look at this. In September, we had 42,000 sales. Um, so cash receipts, this is what we're showing as far as our cash receipts each month. Um, cash sales. Oh, it's saying 40% of our current sales are cash sales. That's what that is. And then our, our credit sales are, we assume we're going to collect everything in the next month. Okay. That's not going to be the case. You're going to have several of them go bad. And they're not factoring that in. I mean, you got to remember uh, accounting 112, no, sorry, accounting 111, where we talked about our bad debt expense in chapter nine. We're going to have some of this bad debts. We're going to have this. So to assume we're going to take all this, I'm just telling you the real world application of what they're teaching you here in this. Um, we're not going to have 60%. That tells us that we're going to collect 100% of these sales. And we're not, we're just not. <clears throat> if we're a manufacturing, we're selling to companies that are selling these retail so we're gonna need um, we're gonna need to have a factor in of, of a bad debt expense. So uh, forty percent of our sales are cash sales, and then we're gonna have sixty percent from the prior month as our collections uh, according to this. So October we're collecting forty nine thousand two hundred, November fifty five thousand two hundred, December sixty two thousand four hundred. <clears throat> oh, I already went over all that. Okay, so now that we know how much we're receiving in cash, now yes. I totally lost why they're doing this again. What is this they're showing? Oh, this is showing that if it's not all in the same month. I was just totally lost here, sorry. This is showing um that if uh in the second one down there they're showing that if what happens if it's actually 80 percent of the cash of the the um 80 percent of the prior prior month sales are collected and then 15 percent two months ago sales so basically this is saying we're saying here 80% of current credit sales will be collected in the following month and then 15% in the month after that. 
So we're saying in December, we're collecting 33,600 from our current 40%. Then we're collecting $23,040 from 80% of this from the prior month and then 5,400 of 15% of this. This is more accurate, this is more realistic because then we're gonna have 5% of sales are gonna go uncollectible. This is, this is more realistic to what it, um, what it really would be. Um, so this is the schedule of cash payments. We're looking at direct materials here. Uh, this is cash payments for direct materials. And this is if we can pay it over uh, several months. So it's showing you kind of both. If we pay it all up front from the prior month. We're paying it in the prior month. And this is showing that if we pay it 20% from the current period and then 80% in the next period. So 20% of this is here. 80% of this is here. And we're going to go through that way. Again, this one's probably more realistic because we're going to get credit terms too. So preparing the cash budget, we're going to start off whoops, with our beginning balance. We're going to add any cash receipts from our sales, what we just calculated. Total cash available. Then we're going to have our direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, sales commission, sales salaries, administrative salaries, income taxes, dividends, interest on loans, purchase of equipment, total cash payments, preliminary cash balance. Here it is. So in these circumstances, I didn't see anything. Here we go. No, nothing's told us yet about what our preliminary balances are supposed to be. So they're saying that we had, it's probably maybe 20,000, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, 20,000 is our ending cash. We have to have at least $20,000 in our um, cash balance. We have a loan amount still remaining after this, after we pay this 5,635 of 4,365. Then we do it again in November. We pay the full amount here. So now our preliminary ending or our ending cash balance is 38,881. So we need a 20,000 ending cash balance. More than likely this 18,881 above the 20,000 we need is gonna go to some kind of bonus or some kind of um, payment towards our owners for in the form of dividends. In fact, yeah, we paid 3,000 dividends here. No dividends here. Um, income taxes. This is interesting why we didn't pay income taxes on these two months. It's really interesting. Anyway, Canada, I don't know their laws. So that's how we do the cash budget. And that's pretty much it. <clears throat> uh, this is showing us that our uh, our beginning loan balance was a hundred thousand. Our interest is ten per, or one percent. That's cheap, and that's not. No, that is that's twelve percent annual. So that's actually not bad. That's probably about par for a, a short term loan. So that's how we're paying it all off. We have our interest. Um, did they show interest here? Yeah, here's our interest here. Here's our interest here. No interest this month because we're done. But we had enough money, and that's probably why we didn't bonus because we knew we needed this twenty five thousand uh, dollars to buy that equipment. That's why we were saving up. Uh, preparing budget financial statements. All we're going to do is take all this information and plug it in. Okay. Just the same thing as what we do for accounting 111. Even though we put the word budget, don't think this is any different than what we would do. Sales. Uh, and then remember, it's net sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus other expenses like selling and administrative expenses. It's going to be our income before taxes. And then we're going to subtract out our income tax expense, which in this case is 40% of our, um, our, in, our net income. And that's going to give us, or our, excuse me, our income before taxes. And then we're going to subtract that out. And that's our net income. Take that net income. We're going to, oh, they didn't even do a statement. Okay. So then we're going to um, do a, a statement of equity for the company. And uh, the retained earnings is where we're going to put our net income. Um, and then the balance sheet's going to just list everything else, our cash, account receivable, raw materials, inventory, finished goods, inventory, equipment, accumulated depreciation, all this other stuff. And it's just like a normal balance sheet. It's just a budgeted balance sheet, okay? Um, this is for a service company. You don't have the direct raw materials or the uh, indirect uh, or the production budget. So that's basically, it's, it's a really watered down version. But there you have it. Um, Direct labor budget for service firm and analyze revenue per employee. Okay, look, this is going to be very similar to what we just did. Budgeted direct labor hours times direct labor costs, direct labor. 
I don't know why you would want revenue per employee. I really don't understand this one. I could be wrong. Maybe it's just to see how much revenue they're deriving based on each employee they have. Maybe they have too many employees. Maybe they have too little. I don't know. Um, no, I'm not going to look. This is the same thing too for merchandise. They literally, the only thing different is going to be the purchases area. Everything else is going to be the same. Purchases is just going to be the same thing as the production. You just don't have to break it down into your uh, individual raw materials and stuff like that because it's just the same hockey den. It's it's the exact same thing as just the production. That's all you're doing is the production budget and calling it merchandise purchases, and that's it. The only difference. Then you have your cash payments. Okay. So anyway, hopefully, if you understand the 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 budget process for your um, manufacturing companies, you're fine. You're going to be just fine because all these other ones are just appendages or just a, a watered down version of that complicated mess. Not mess. It's actually really fun. I love doing them. They're really good. It's kind of exciting to go through and see it all. So I hope you find the same fun and excitement I do. I love budgets. I live on one, and uh, it's it's a good thing. If you're not doing a budget for yourself in your own personal life, I highly recommend that you you do that. All right, and and start looking and seeing where your money spends and where money spends where your money goes as you spend it, and you will realize I'm spending a lot of crap on Starbucks. I'm spending a lot of crap on games. I could be saving this money or I could not have to pay. I could pay my car off sooner. I hate car loans. They are so predatory. Uh, I got a five-year loan one time. I paid off in two years. I just hate them. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. So um, anyway, but that's just me. And I hate consumer debt. I pay my, I use my credit card just to get points and I pay it all off at the end of the month. So um, definitely recommend if that's what you do, go for it. But uh got to keep yourself disciplined when you do those things so anyway hey guys that's the end of chapter 22 we'll see you in the homework and other uh videos take care and we'll see you later oh haha i'm still recording i said something because i forgot the name or the word and i didn't because i didn't stop it yet i don't have to merge the, the videos i hate doing that it takes forever all right the word for you guys is don't, don't i just said son of a i didn't say anything else um barry B-E-R-R-Y, Barry, Bravo, Echo, Romeo, Romeo, Yankee, Barry, B-E-R-R-Y is your word for this chapter 22. Uh, take care, guys. I'm stopping recording now.